Good morning, everyone. I'm Larry Williams, the director of the Center for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis, or CARMA, uh, here at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, it's February 22nd, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another version of Meet the Methodologist, uh, our opportunity to chat with our distinguished methodologist visitors as they come to campus to give a webcast lecture. And today it's a real honor to have visiting us uh, Mo Wang from the University of Florida. Uh, as you may know, Mo is currently an associate editor for the Journal of Applied Psychology and also a 2013 APA Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contributions winner. So, Mo, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. All right, so, uh, Mo, you got your degree at Bowling Green, mm -hmm. yes. about an hour down the road. <laughs> yes. How was it that you ended up in Bowling Green? Oh, so uh, when I was uh, graduating from undergraduate, uh, I applied um, uh, graduate school. Well, my GRE scores are not very good. I just want to put that out there. Um, and uh, But then I want to apply for uh, schools that have both good uh, development psychology program and IO psychology program. Um, Bowling Green actually happens to have a very good tradition in adult development research. And they have a very good quant guy, uh, John Tiasek, which I will mention later as well. Um, then, but they also have very awesome I.O. program. Uh, so I applied Bowling Green and uh, I applied to a lot of other schools which have both uh, strong programs. And uh, well, lucky enough, like I got admitted by Bowling Green. So I entered Bowling Green as a development psychology uh, PhD student. And so, um, yeah, I enjoyed my four years there. So in my third year, I said, oh, uh, I really want to pursue this uh, joint PhD in development psychology and IO psychology, where you guys allow me. And uh, well, faculty at Bowling Green, well, they are pretty cool. So they said, ah, yeah, why not? So, you know, uh, that's how I ended up here. So. Okay, and uh, was that about the time that you first got exposed to karma? Uh, yes, so uh, my first, I still remember this vividly, so it was uh, 2005, uh, there was one Friday, uh, it was uh, David Hoffman talking about multi-level modeling, the HRM, and then the, uh, James LeBrenton talking about the aggregation and agreementing measures, and the, 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 the memory is so vivid is because that those two talks are so long, I mean, they're good talks, but they are very long, they are three hours each, and uh, I was in the conference room like uh, for one day, whole day. So, but then that was a really good experience, and uh, um, ever since I just, um, I love comma. Yes. Okay. Well, we're, we're glad to hear that, and we're glad that you could take the time uh, and endure the harsh weather to, to come and contribute. So how was it during that process that you got interested in research methods mm -hmm. uh, and, and quantitative stuff? Mm, so um, I already, um, before I came to graduate school, I already uh, know how to do like uh, most of the regression, ANOVA, uh, factor analysis, because I, I, I did my undergraduate in Peking University, so their psych department is the best psych department in China. Uh, and they had a lot of Western tradition, like a lot of uh, faculty, older faculty, they are actually like uh, PhDs in Western countries. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we had a very good quant training. So when I came to Bowling Green, like, uh, I mean, quant class is the first class like I can I can directly like uh, uh, understand without any language barrier. So it was it was it was natural for me to really get interested in. And then the, another thing is we had John Tisak teaching the psychometrics, and he is one of the pioneers who developed latent growth curve modeling. So taking a class from him is a treat. And the, the, the treat part is that when you take the class, you don't know what he's talking about. you like, he's talking about everything. And then you're like, you're just writing things on the notes and you're like, oh my God, I need to figure this out. This is, uh, this is uh, like uh, really beyond my uh, understanding. But then afterwards, if you keep reading new things, you read the readings, all the notes come back to you and they all make perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So it was really um, from John, like I was, um, my, my interest about research methods get reinforced. Yeah. So. Well, uh, so you come out of Bowling Green and you obviously have a lot of success uh, as indicated by the many awards that you've received. And along the way, you have served as a reviewer and I'm always interested in uh, the comments that you might have about what you see in your role as a reviewer of the most frequent limitations or shortcomings in, in mm -hmm. articles that you have to process. Um, yeah, so most um, 
issue I see about manuscripts that get rejected is uh, because the authors didn't motivate the manuscript enough. So it's not about the methodology, it's not about like the theoretical uh, like, uh, reasoning. It's really about the author in the first three or four pages did not motivate the paper, did not say, hey, why this topic is so important for us to study. And uh, when you um, deal with manuscripts like that, then it, like, it doesn't matter how good your later pieces are. Like, it it's just becomes like, a, um, not very interesting. So I think a lot of manuscripts, uh, uh, let's say, are rejected um, because of that reason. Uh, but then also another thing is um, a lot of time people don't really operationalize their theory uh, in, the, in, the, in the right way. So if, for example, if you uh, hypothesis a uh, mechanism to explain your phenomena, then you'd better directly operationalize that mechanism rather than just saying, hey, by speculation. So I think that's another uh, fundamental issue that lead manuscript to be rejected. Okay. So uh, let's assume for the moment that those comments maybe apply more to substantive articles, mm -hmm. maybe not. But you also have a lot of experience as a reviewer and as an editor, including mm -hmm. the, the research methods and occupational health uh, area. Are there areas within the way that we currently study research methods that you think we're doing, a, that methodologists are doing a particularly good job of investigating? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are there other areas where you feel like we're really off track and missing the key stuff? Uh, I would say what we do really well is, well, from the IO psychology perspective, we do really well in terms of measurement. Like uh, we develop our measurement in a rigorous way. Uh, we usually um, care a lot about the psychometric property of our measures. Um, so that's really good, and I, I don't think other field is doing as rigorous job as we do. Um, however, um, as a field, we pay very little attention to sampling, uh, which is kind of frustrating because uh, if you look at you, so so, I think this is a big barrier between the uh, org psych field with like other social science field. Because if you don't pay attention to sampling, it's very hard for you to have a conversation with, for example, people from econ or people from uh, sociology. Because the, those fields, they care about sampling a lot, and their methods are specifically developed to accommodating sampling issues. So I think as a field, uh, our, uh, we need to move forward uh, in taking account for sampling. Even we do convenience sampling, we can still do a better job than what we're doing right now. Okay. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you are currently the associate, an associate editor at the Journal of Applied Psychology. And I was wondering if you kind of stop and reflect on uh, what your view of our process was at the time that you became the editor versus now that you've had this experience. How has your view of the research process evolved given your experience as an associate editor? Um, I would say like before uh, I was taking on that role, um, uh, most of like I'm an outsider. So I'm uh, dealing with reviewers as an author and I'm trying to respond to their concerns. Um, but now um, more and more dealing with making editorial decision myself, uh, I think um, first of all everyone should understand that reviewers are really overloaded. Um, think about all the editorial board members, like they are going to uh, review at least one manuscript a month. And the thing is, if you're an editorial member in a top journal, you're likely to be an editorial member for another top journal. So people are really overloaded. Uh, so it takes a lot uh, for the authors to explain their papers right, uh, to actually um, present their idea clearly, so that the reviewers uh, can, um, it can make the reviewer's job easier. But uh, on the other hand, then reviewers um, probably a lot of time need to be more uh, promotion focused and uh, try to uh, uh, help more about developing the paper. So, uh, and also uh, another thing I hope reviewers can do is um, if they can, whenever they point out a problem, if they can also provide a suggested solution or even just say, hey, there's no solution for this. I think that's much better than leaving the authors hanging there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that will help develop the paper as well. Mm -hmm. 
already okay. accepted. Yeah. Um, so you know, whenever yeah, we get um, authors and uh, reviewers and editors together, everybody has their ideas about things that can be done to improve the process. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you know, it's a very dynamic uh, environment in which journals operate with all kinds of changes going on not only in the publication process but in the university systems and I was wondering whether you have any thoughts of uh, things that can be done to improve that process the, re the, the review and or publication process um, I, I would I would say the review process can be um, probably more systematic uh, I would say uh, it may be good uh, for the reviewers of a journal and to go through a standardized training in terms of uh, what are the general issues that um, the journal cares about uh, in terms of the um, publication process and also how to be as I said a promotional about the research uh, rather than just uh, finding out the mistakes about the uh, manuscript um, and also I think uh, from the reviewers uh, side uh, the reviewers uh, need to be a little bit more accommodating and also if they come across uh, fields or knowledge they are not uh, familiar with, then uh, I think some due diligence is warranted rather than just uh, um, not trying to figure out what's going on. Because a lot of, think about this, uh, cutting edge methodological stuff is going to be complicated. And uh, um, it, there's no guarantee that every re reviewer is going to understand it. But then uh, how does um, that get um, processed in, in, the, uh, in the publication uh, uh, procedures? I, I think that's uh, something we need to think about. Okay. So, um, you got your degree, degree in 2005, and so in less than 10 years, you've had a tremendous amount of success. And uh, I'm wondering, given that, if you, as you kind of reflect on that part of your career so far, are there particular characteristics you have that you uh -huh. think have contributed to that success? And what advice do you have for doctoral students who are wanting to have success uh, mm -hmm. as a scholar? Um, well, I would say, well, I study adjustment process. And I would say I'm pretty good in adapting and adjusting to different environment. Um, then underlying that is uh, you can always find people surrounding you you can learn from. So every place I was, uh, I was trying to learn from people, my colleagues, um, even a lot of time my students, I learn their strengths and uh, I try to avoid the weakness. And, uh, um, but, but the thing is, if you learn enough, you're going to um, make all your research have much better quality. Um, and uh, um, then you, you are going to assemble a very desirable um, um, qualities in your research uh, and then that will help you to um, publish. I mean, we are in a publication uh, field. So uh, any strengths that can help you to publish is going to be undesirable. So, okay. Uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, you're here to give uh, a Karma webcast lecture in a couple hours on growth mixture modeling. I was wondering if you could kind of tell us how you got interested in that topic and uh -huh. give a short overview of what you're going to be talking about today. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happened was uh, really um, I was, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I was exposed to John Tessak uh, when I was in Bowling Green and at the time John was the one actually, um, before anyone knows M Plus exists as a software, John knows that already. And then uh, I actually started using M Plus when it was 1.0. And which is a very painful. Uh, uh, and then, like, uh, yes, uh, it uh, went up to like a 2.1, and then uh, my dissertation was done with 3.1. And but then over the process, I learned that, um, the Mutain came up with this uh, gross mixture modeling methods, and I looked into the method. Uh, it's fascinating because it goes beyond about just uh, characterizing single population. Rather, it helps you to identify unobserved population in terms of their change trajectories. Uh, so I was trying to find a research scenario to apply it. So it really, the methods came to me first before I can apply it. And then uh, I had my opportunity to do my um, decision, uh, the dissertation on the uh, retirement adjustment. And then I had, a, somehow I had a big enough sample and I can apply the method and it was a success. So, um, so I, I think for me, uh, 
the, 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 um, it starts with a methodological interest, but then it gives me a lot of substantial uh, good points to talk about for the field. Mm -hmm. so. And so how is it that you would characterize it as a success? What did that, your dissertation, what, what did that tool mm -hmm. uh, allow you to do oh. that you might not have otherwise been able to do? Oh yeah, uh, so basically in the retirement literature, if you look at the retirement adjustment literature in the past 20, 30 years, um, people have contradictory findings. It's very interesting, like uh, you, you, some people say retirement is good, right? People say, hey, after retirement you go, you sit on the beach, you drink Mai Tai, and uh, you, know, you just uh, enjoy your life. Um, and some other people say, hey, wait a second, retirement is bad. People, are as they feel anxiety, they don't feel very good, they feel stressed. Oh, you know, so, so, so they are very contradictory findings. And the, the thing is, using this method, you can actually re reconcile them, those findings. Because the thing is, all the findings are valid. They are all, like, uh, there's no issue with the research quality there. What it happens is they probably different findings are based on different kind of samples. So you need a way to reconcile the sample difference. So basically, applying the method, I was able to show actually, yes, the positive change happened, but it only happens for about like 5 to 10% of people. And then the negative change also happened. It happens to about 20 to 25% of people. And the majority of the population, actually retirement does not do much to their psychological well-being. So using this method, you can reconcile all the inconsistent findings. You can tie the theories together. And I think this is an important contribution of research methodology in developing theories. And you cannot achieve that if this method doesn't exist. Okay, uh, Mo, I'd like to close out with a couple of uh, a more personal types of questions. What are the things that you like the most and like the least about your work? <laughs> uh, the most, um, I get to learn all the new stuff. I can learn whatever I want to learn and uh, uh, eventually applying them to the work I do to understand the things that people don't understand very well. I think that's, that's just fun to do. Uh, well, the bad part of the work is that there are so many deadlines <laughs> and also uh, you have to deal with rejection all the time. I mean, uh, it's like you need more than six skin to deal with rejection, especially nowadays, as I mentioned, the reviewers are old, overloaded. Mm -hmm. You cannot expect them to be very nice. So um, that's something like uh, um, I don't enjoy particularly, but uh, I think uh, we need to, as I said, we need to probably think something about uh, reforming our review process or publication process uh, to, to change that situation. So. Okay. And uh, last, uh, is there anything that you like to do to um, draw inspiration or motivation for your work, maybe when your batteries are running a little low and you need that extra boost? Um, well, I, I, do, I do two kinds of things. Uh, one is really like um, proximal, is like I, I don't just focus on the IO literature, OB literature, I read a lot about general literature in psychology. I read uh, Psycho Boo, I read the Psycho Review, I try to get to at least to know what other people are doing in psychology. Okay, and a lot of times they give me some new ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but then um, that's, that's the proximal thing, it's still work related, but then uh, uh, I also read a lot about history, I do a lot of like uh, uh, historical readings. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, actually, interesting enough, if you really dive into that literature, you find out that the historians, they care about the same thing we care about. They care about causality. They care about proving causality in their, in their writing. So then, um, and they, they usually have very good multi-level view about decomposing a phenomena and explaining it. So, um, so I draw a lot of things, uh, inspiration from uh, reading historical literature. So. Yeah. All right. Well, we're really very excited to have you here and uh, very much looking forward to your uh, webcast. And uh, we know how busy a person with your accomplishments are, and we appreciate you taking the time to come to, uh, to Detroit and join us with Karma. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Mo Wang, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. we got plenty of other Meet the Methodologist lectures on our YouTube channel, so uh, we hope you enjoy those as well. Thanks, and enjoy your day.